Hey guys, so as you might have already seen all over the news, IonQ, the quantum computing hardware startup for Maryland, is going public through a SPAC and will thus become the first publicly traded pure quantum computing company. So I thought I'd finally make a video to explain what is going on and see for myself how good their device actually is and if it lives up to the hype. So let's start from the beginning. IMQ was founded by Professor Christopher Monroe and Professor Jiang Sam Kim from the University of Maryland and Duke University back in 2015. Since then, they have successfully grown the startup to now compete with technology giants such as IBM, Google and Honeywell. Since summer of last year, their 11 qubit device has been publicly available via AWS and just recently also via Azure Quantum, Microsoft's cloud computing service. As the name suggests, IonQ is using ions to realize their qubits. Calculations are performed by manipulating the hyperfine energy states of iterbium ions with lasers. This is in contrast to the superconducting quantum circuit technology that is pursued by IBM, Google and Rigetti. And by the looks of it also Amazon, though we don't have many details on their hardware ambitions just yet. Quantum computing based on ion traps is currently only seriously pursued by IonQ, Honeywell and Alpine Quantum Technologies, which is a small Innsbruck based startup. Both technologies come with their pros and cons. Generally speaking, ion-based devices have lower error rates than superconducting devices, and more importantly, all-to-all -all connectivity. This means that arbitrary qubits can be entangled with each other. This is not the case for superconducting devices, where only qubits that are physically coupled can directly be entangled. To entangle qubits that are physically far apart, we need to use so-called swap gates that swap the qubit states to bring them closer together such that they can be entangled. This network of swap gates is costly and causes a great overhead, which is the reason why a lot of research is going into circuit compression to reduce the overhead. Startups such as Cambridge Quantum Computing are building software to specifically tackle this problem. So the fact that this is not an issue for ion-based devices gives them a great advantage. However, on the other hand, ion trap devices generally have a significantly lower clock speed, which means that the same gate on an ion trap device usually takes significantly longer to run than on a superconducting device. Scalability for both device types beyond their current size is a big question mark. At some day, both ion trap and superconducting devices will most likely have to couple multiple devices to really go beyond a few thousand qubits. At this stage, this really is just research in its very early days. Now coming back to IonQ. In early March of this year, we got confirmation that IonQ will go public through a SPAC and trade in the New York Stock Exchange under the handle IonQ. SPAC is short for Special Purpose Acquisition Company and is the latest boom coming out of Silicon Valley. SPACs are essentially shell companies that list on a stock exchange and then acquire or merge with an operating private company. This route to the stock market is often quicker and involves fewer steps than traditional IPOs. In IonQ's case, they will merge with DMY Technology Group which will bring them at a total evaluation of over 2 billion US dollars. This massive cash injection will allow them to rapidly scale their device. IonQ's SPAC also comes with a bit of controversy. Last year, they announced that their 32 qubit device had the largest quantum volume on the market and would beat their competition by a mile. So far, we still haven't seen any confirmation of these numbers which makes some people think that it was purely a marketing stunt. So to find out how good their device actually is and if it lives up to the hype, I thought I'd finally put it head to head with IBM's device 
to see which one is better. All right, so let's find out which device is better, IBM versus IonQ. And I'm starting off here at Amazon Web Services, AWS, in Amazon Bracket, where we have access to a bunch of um, quantum computers. And we're gonna be comparing this IonQ device here um, with an IBM device. And so as you can see, this is their 11 qubit device. So this is the smaller uh, quantum computer that they have. and uh, which also has a bit higher error rates than their flagship device, but the flagship device is not available to the public. So this is what we have available and you can see here the cost. So it does cost a bit of money to use this thing. And you can see here the topology. And as I was saying, this is this all to all connectivity. So all qubits can be entangled with each other um, without having to do any swaps. And so this is um, the first device the IonQ device and the second device is the one from IBM. So I'm heading over here to um, IBM Quantum and I will check out here the quantum services that are available to me. And so this is totally for free. Everyone can use this. Um, so I'm not paying anything. And so these are all the devices that we have access to. And I'm gonna be comparing the IonQ device with the IBM um, Santiago device. It has um, one of the highest quantum volumes here and five qubits. Um, and so this is the topology of the IBM Santiago device. So as you can see, the qubits on the quantum processor, they are, um, they are orientated like this. So they have basically here, um, they're just on a line, they're sitting on a line, so I can entangle qubit number zero with qubit number one, and qubit number one with qubit number two, so on and so forth. And if I want to uh, entangle qubits that are not neighbors, we need to use swap gates, which is not the case in the, um, in the ion Q device that I was just showing to you. So I've cooked up here um, a little Jupyter notebook to compare the two devices. So first of all, I'm importing here um, a bunch of stuff that we need uh, to access the devices. And so here, this is the import to access the AWS devices. Uh, so basically all you need is you need to create an S3 bucket and you need to create a folder in there and then you can access the device if you have an AWS account. I will not go into the details of how to do that. I will just link a Medium article um, down below in the description uh, where you can check it out in detail. And so what I'm plotting here is um, a random graph. So this is the graph that I will use to entangle the qubits. So basically this is here just an instruction which qubits um, I want to entangle. So here I want to entangle qubit zero with qubit one and then qubit zero with qubit four, qubit zero with qubit three, so on and so forth. And so this is here these, this graph. And so on the IonQ machine, this should not be any issue since we can entangle everything. But on the IBM device, on the other hand, since we only have this topology here, we will need a lot of swap gates um, to make this happen. And so you will see the effects of these swap gates shortly. So now here I've written um, two functions that will create a uh, random circuit. So the circuit is basically just an instruction uh, for some uh, operations to be performed on the quantum computer. And so this is here for the device from IBM in Qiskit. And this is here the device from IonQ using AWS. And you can see the code is almost identical. There are some syntax differences, but more or less it's the same thing. And so this creates um, a random quantum circuit that looks like this, where we have here uh, single qubit rotations, random single qubit rotations on five qubits. Uh, with random angles as well. So then we also have here these C0 gates that entangle the qubits. Um, and these C0 gates here, they're entangled over this uh, graph here. So this is the instruction of which qubits to entangle. And so um, this is basically what it looks like. And so then I have two layers of this. So I'm repeating this two times. I have two layers of random single qubit rotations, entanglement, 
and then once again. And so this is here for a uh, KISS kit for the IBM device and this is for the AWS device. And so you can see they are both the same. So now here I'm just um, extracting the exact result from a simulator. So since we're only using five qubits, we can easily uh, calculate uh, what a perfect quantum computer uh, would yield us. For five qubits, this is still possible. But if we go to, let's say, about 50 qubits, um, a classical computer can no longer simulate what is going on here. And this is more or less what Google did in their quantum supremacy experiment, um, where they really just had a random circuit, um, which you can no longer simulate on a classical computer. So here I'm running um, this uh, on the simulator from IBM, the KISS kit simulator, and then the simulator from um, Amazon Web Services. And you can see it's, it's more or less um, the same thing. The only difference is that really uh, when using Amazon Web Services, we need to be careful with the order of the um, bit string, so of the final uh, result um, from the quantum computer, the order here is reversed. Uh, this is something that we need to take uh, care of. So now here I'm just plotting the exact result that we anticipate um, the quantum computer to give us. And you can see, so this one is uh, in blue is from um, Kiskit from IBM and uh, um, the, the purple or red one is from, from Amazon Web Services and you can see that they match. Um, you just really need to be careful with this reversion of the bit string. So basically um, in Qiskit, a bit string, for example, would be 00100. And uh, this is a bad example, actually. Um, for example, 00101 um, on Qiskit and on AWS, it is the other way around. So we would start off with a one. So we just need to take this into account. But you can see, uh, taking this into account, they both match. And so this is what we expect um, to get. And now we will just try it out on the real quantum computers. So I'm running this same circuit on a real quantum computer here from IBM, the Santiago device. I'm running it a thousand times and then I will get a probability distribution of different results. And every measurement yields a different results, but some are more probable and happen more often. And so, I've run this here in advanced already. Uh, I'm showing you the, the quantum circuit that was implemented. So let's uh, check this out. So this was the quantum circuit. It was run on the real quantum computer from IBM. And what you notice here straight away is that this thing is very, very, very deep. So this is an, almost an internal uh, string of, of, of C0 operations here. And the reason for that is exactly um, the swaps. Um, as I was saying before, I want to entangle qubits like this, but on the quantum computer, um, this is the topology that um, I have. So I need to swap around the qubit states. And so whenever you see these uh, three C knots, this is most likely a swap operation that is taking place here. So you can really see that the, the swap operations are taking up a good chunk of our calculation. This is really a, a bottleneck, as you can see here. Now, on the um, IonQ device, this is not the case. We do not have to do the swap operations. We can directly entangle all the qubits. So I've run here um, the same quantum circuit on the IonQ device, um, as you can see. And I'm just taking care also here of the of the order of the bit strings. And so now let's plot the result and let's see which one performs better. All right, so this is the result. Um, I'm now comparing here in blue the exact result, the, ex the result that we um, that we anticipate with the, um, the result from the real quantum computers. And in red, here's IBM, um, the IBM device. And in purple, there's the IMQ device. And you notice straight away here that basically the IBM device has a lot of noise going on. At, um, it has some probability at bit strings that we actually do not want. Um, so there's quite a bit of noise going on. 
then both devices clearly do not get um, this peak here right at all. They're both off by quite a mile. And then um, here towards the left, you can see that interestingly, the IonQ device kind of matches the exact result, but the IBM device is very far off. But you can see there's a lot of noise going on. So from, from this picture alone, it's not quite clear yet who has won. But I think the IBM device has uh, a bit more noise going on here. So now let's uh, continue with the comparison. Let's uh, calculate here the difference between um, the exact result and the um, result from the quantum computers. So this is what I'm doing here. I'm summing up all of these differences. And so basically if the sum here is zero, then the two um, histograms match. And if it is more than one, um, they are different. And what you can see here is that the, 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 the sum from the uh, uh, IBM device is actually bigger than the one from the um, IonQ device. So indeed the IonQ device was able to reproduce um, the exact result more accurately. There were less errors. So now I'm plotting, um, I will plot here actually um, the difference for every one of those bit strings. So every dot here is the difference um, to the exact result. And so what you see here is that clearly the IonQ device has more dots towards the bottom. So uh, less difference um, to the exact result. And the IBM device has more dots um, towards the you know larger difference region. And I've also plotted here um, these dashed lines that indicate the average result. And you can see that the IonQ result is below the IBM device. And if we plot this here in log scale, um, where basically these differences are amplified, you can really see that the IonQ device has a lot of dots towards um, a very little difference um, with the exact result, you know, 10 to the minus three. Um, and the I, uh, IBM device has more dots towards the top here. But I would say that, you know, this difference here is maybe not um, statistically significant enough to, to make a conclusion yet. We would have to repeat this um, calculation with multiple uh, random circuits. So, you know, this is one random circuit instance. We would have to do this with multiple random circuit instances and then average over this and also plot here a standard deviation and then compare it this way. Um, but at least for this one instance, um, the IonQ device um, won, I would say. So you can see that really um, this lack of, of swap gates that we, we have on the IonQ device is definitely an advantage. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, I cannot really um, do a more thorough analysis because running the circuit costs money. And so if I were to, to run this, let's say, 100 times, you know, I would pay... Uh, yeah, a good chunk of money, a few um, visits to a nice restaurant, uh, probably, to 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 really get a thorough analysis um, going here. And also, uh, what I didn't tell you is that executing the the um, IonQ device it takes a literal eternity uh, to run. The queue is is very long at the moment. It took me almost two hours to actually uh, get this result back from the machine. Uh, on the IBM machine, it's a bit quicker. So basically, I think the the result is that the IBM device is free. Um, it gives you almost um, the same result as the IonQ device, but the IonQ device clearly does come with its advantages. So it will be very, very interesting to see uh, how this scales in the future once um, the both devices uh, get bigger and bigger. And also I only compare to, you know, very, very small devices, the, the IBM device, five qubits, IonQ, um, I also only compared it uh, with using five qubits. So I think that both uh, the differences between the, the two devices will really uh, only come into effect once we are, um, you know, working with, you know, let's say 50, 50 qubits, and then we can really make an assessment. So yeah, this is, um, this is the current state of quantum computing. You can see a lot of errors are, are still um, floating around here. Um, 
But I think the, the flagship devices of um, IBM and IonQ, they already have less errors than these uh, publicly available devices. All right, so guys, thank you very much for watching. If you made it all the way towards the end, please give the video a like. It really helps out the algorithm and also uh, stay tuned and subscribe for more quantum computing content.